Okay, uh, why don't we start here? I think we've got the uh, AV situation mostly under control here. Um, so uh, for our next session, we'll be starting, I guess, five to six minutes late, so we'll just sort of keep that offset in our schedule. Uh, our next session will be uh, kicked off by uh, uh, John Preskill, who will be talking to us about uh, superconducting qubits. Thanks, Andrew. Everybody can hear okay? I'm talking about work done at Caltech with Peter Brooks and Alexei Kataev. All of us here recognize that error correction and fault tolerance are going to be essential if we're going to operate large-scale quantum computers someday. The standard approach to fault tolerance uses clever circuit design to overcome the deficiencies of hardware. There's an alternative hardware or topological approach in which the hardware itself has intrinsic resistance to noise because of the nature of the physical encoding of the quantum information. And it may be that both of these approaches will be used together in future quantum computers. But it's important for the time being to seek new ways in which we can build quantum hardware with some kind of intrinsic robustness which results from the way the information is encoded. One suggestion has been that we can make robust encodings of quantum information using superconducting circuits, in particular the zero pi qubit, which was suggested by Kataev and others. The phase in a superconductor is a periodic variable with period two pi, but for a suitably designed circuit, the dependence of that circuit's energy on the phase difference between its two leads is a very good approximation of periodic function of theta with period pi, aside from corrections that become very small as the device gets large. And in that case, the energy as a function of theta has two minima, which can occur at theta equals zero and theta equals pi, which have very nearly the same energy. And if there's a large barrier separating those minima, those two minima can be the basis states of a robust qubit. It's protected against bit flips by the high barrier in between zero and one, and it's protected against dephasing because the, degenerate, the degeneracy of the two states is very stable with respect to perturbations of the Hamiltonian. But of course, if we want to do robust quantum computing, we need more than just stable qubits. We also need to be able to do very accurate gates, and that's what I want to describe in the talk, how in particular we can do highly accurate Clifford gates acting on zero pi qubits by turning on and then turning off the coupling of the qubit to our harmonic oscillator in LC circuit. And the gate will work very effectively, be highly accurate, if the inductance in the LC circuit in natural units is a very large number. The secret that underlies the reliability of the gate is actually a quantum code, a continuous variable quantum code in which uh, qubit, a two-dimensional system, is embedded in the infinite dimensional Hilbert space of a harmonic oscillator. And I'll be explaining how that works. Now to understand the physics of the zero pi qubit itself and also the protected gates, we should know a little bit about Josephson junctions. A Josephson junction is a device in which a layer of insulating material separates two pieces of superconductors such that there's a non-zero amplitude for the charge carriers in the Stirr-Cooper pairs to tunnel from one side of the barrier to the other side. And we can encode that tunneling in an effective Hamiltonian if we think of a lead attached via Josephson junction to an island that carries some charge, a superconducting island. Then the effective Hamiltonian describes processes in which the charge on the island can either increase by one or decrease by one when a Cooper pair tunnels through if Q is the charge in units of 2E, the Cooper pair charge. And there's some amplitude for the tunneling, which I've called J, the Josephson coupling. It's often convenient to describe the system using conjugate variables, the superconducting phase rather than the charge, which is just the Fourier conjugate of the charge. So the phase and the charge obey commutation relations like the position and momentum of a particle in one dimension. And if we express the tunneling Hamiltonian in terms of the phase, proportional to cosine phi with the coefficient given by the tunneling amplitude j. 
So one other thing we should know about superconductors is that flux is quantized. The phase in a superconductor is actually a convention dependent concept. If I want to compare the phase at two different points in the superconductor, I need some notion of parallel transport that tells me how the phase should change as I move from one point to another. That notion of parallel transport is provided by a connection, which is just the electromagnetic vector potential. And the parallel transport of phase is actually path dependent. That means that connection has curvature. The curvature is just the magnetic field. So when there's a non-trivial magnetic field, the phase picked up under parallel transport can depend upon the path. If we have a closed ring of superconductor and there's some applied flux, it might be that the effect of parallel transport of the phase around the loop is non-trivial, and that's energetically unfavorable. So what happens in case is that some persistent current flows in the ring, which adds to the applied field some additional field produced by the current in such a way that the effect of parallel transport around the ring really is trivial. And that means that the magnetic flux enclosed by the ring is an integer multiple of a quantum of flux, h over 2e. If I think of a ring with a Josephson junction inserted inside, I can think of the phase difference between one side of the Josephson junction and the other as not a periodic variable with period 2 pi, but a real variable. Because if phi winds by 2 pi, that just means we've inserted one quantum of flux through the ring. Now, I'm also going to want to consider LC circuits in superconductors. This is really just uh, like a particle in a harmonic well, where the uh, charge on the capacitor corresponds to the momentum of the particle, and the superconducting phase is like addition of a particle. I can think of that as the phase drop across the inductance, which is proportional to the magnetic flux linking the circuit. So it's convenient to use natural units for this problem to express charge in terms of the Cooper pair charge 2e and to express the flux linking the circuit in terms of the superconducting phase drop across the inductor. And then in terms of those units, the square root of L over C is a dimensionless number. It's just the conventional impedance of the circuit expressed in terms of these units, which is about one kilo ohm. So we can ask, what's the significance of that dimensionless number being large? And the answer is that in the ground state of this oscillator, the circuit has very large phase fluctuations. The ground state is a Gaussian wave function where the uh, distribution in phi is wide compared to 2 pi with that width determined by the square root of L over C. Now we can imagine insertion junction into a circuit which has a large inductance in this sense and then its energy will be proportional to this uh, difference of phases. But because of the large fluctuations in phi, the cosine gets averaged over many cycles of the cosine, and that makes the contribution to the energy that depends on the phase theta very small because of the averaging, exponentially small in the width in phi space, which is determined by the large inductance. So now we know enough to understand the idea of the protected zero pi qubit. This is the form in which Kataev suggested it. We can think of a superconducting circuit with two rungs. On each rung, there's a large inductance obeying uh, this condition. And the two rungs are coupled together by some very large capacitance. So I can consider the variable which, uh, I can consider the phase in the superconductor on either side of the capacitor. And then the sum of the phases, phi 1 and phi 2, the plus, is unaffected by the large capacitance. And so it's a light variable because of the large inductance, which has very large fluctuations. But the difference variable, phi 1 minus phi 2, feels the large capacitance. And that makes it a very heavy variable, which wants to be well localized in phase. And so it locks to a value, which is determined by the phases on the external leads, uh, to the difference between theta 4 and theta 1, and minus the difference between theta 3 and theta 2. And now we can imagine taking the top rung and twisting it by 180 degrees and connecting the leads together so that we're identifying theta 2 with theta 4 and theta 3 with theta 1. And then the energy of the circuit becomes a function of the value that the heavy variable locks to, which is now 2 theta 2 minus theta 1. And then there's some correction but it's very small because of the large variations of the light variable. And that's how we can get a zero pi qubit in which the potential is essentially a periodic function with period pi, which has 
two minima, which are very nearly degenerate. In fact, we can think of the protection as arising from a very non-local encoding of information, like in other contexts where we have topological prote uh, protection, if we imagine, as Kataev suggested, that we realize the large inductance by a long chain of Josephson junctions, and then the phase difference between one end of the chain and the other is distributed very non-locally among many devices in the chain. And because of the large fluctuations in the phase, those states locally look almost identical. And the breaking of the degeneracy is associated with tunneling phenomena, which run all the way from one end of the chain to the other, which have an amplitude which uh, is exponentially small. And that's the reason why the corrections, degeneracy, get very small when the device scales up. We'll also want to be able to measure the zero pi qubit. If we measure it in the standard or computational basis, we need to distinguish a phase drop across the qubit of zero from a phase drop of pi. And we could do that by coupling the qubit to a Josephson junction and inserting a quarter of a flux quantum. And then the current that flows will either be clockwise or counterclockwise, depending on whether the phase difference between the two sides of the qubit is zero or pi. We'll also want to be able to measure in the dual basis, the uh, X basis, dual to this computational basis. And one way we can imagine doing that is by breaking the connection that identifies theta 1 and theta 3, and then measuring the charge variable, which is conjugate to the difference between theta 1 and theta 3. Because if we look at how uh, the energy depends on if I slowly vary theta 1 with theta 3 fixed, then to stay at the minimum of the energy, if theta 1 rotates by 2 pi, theta 2 would rotate by pi. And then the state would either be invariant if x equals 1, if it's a superposition of the 0 and 1 in the computational basis, or it will change sign if x is equal to minus 1. And I can distinguish those possibilities by making a charge measurement, distinguishing between a charge which is an integer or, well, an odd or an even integer multiple of the electron charge, that is half the Cooper pair charge. Now these measurements might be kind of noisy, but we can imagine making them more robust by repeating the measurements or by using coding, which I'll mention later. Okay, so now I can start to explain how one does the protected gate. We've seen that a large inductance is important for the operation of the zero pi qubit, but from now on, I'm going to talk about the internal structure of the qubit. We'll just assume it's a very good qubit. But a large inductance will enter the discussion a second time for a rather different reason than before. When I perform the protected gate, either a single qubit uh, Clifford group gate, a rotation about the z-axis by pi over 2, or a two-qubit entangling gate, I will couple either one qubit or a pair of qubits connected in series to an oscillator, another LC circuit with a large inductance. And what one finds if one simulates the process in which we t close a switch to couple the qubit to the LC circuit, leave the switch closed for a while for some prescribed amount of time, and then open the switch, decoupling the oscillator from the qubit or pair of qubits, is that a superposition of the state 0 and 1 of the 0 pi qubit becomes a superposition with a modified phase and the phase change, if I keep the switch closed for the right amount of time, will be pi over 2. So we've done a rotation about the z-axis, if I'm considering a, coupling a single qubit to the oscillator by pi over 2. And the final state of the oscillator is essentially independent of whether the state of the qubit was 0 or 1. So there's no entanglement between the oscillator and the 0 pi qubit. And the phase, e to the minus i pi over 2, is extremely stable with respect to deformations in the pulse and fluctuations in the Hamiltonian. So for example, if this inductance parameter is chosen to be 80, then we get the ideal gate to an accuracy in the diamond norm, which is about 10 to the minus 8, even if the errors in the pulse that implements the gate are at about the 1% level. So now we'd like to understand how this can be. Why is the gate so robust? And the answer really uh, is found by thinking about a quantum code, a code in which qubit is embedded in the Hilbert space of a harmonic oscillator. 
We can think of it as a stabilizer code, as a simultaneous eigenstate uh, with eigenvalue 1 of two poly operators, where the poly operators in this case are e to the 2 i phi, which translates in q space by 2, and e to the minus 2 pi i q, which translates in phi space by 2 pi. Phi and Q don't commute with one another, but these phase space translations do commute, and so they can be simultaneously diagonalized. If I choose both these operators to be one, there's a two-dimensional code space, and I can choose for, as a basis for the space, the code states 0 and 1, where 0 is a superposition of phi eigenstates, where the value of phi is pi times an even integer, and 1 is a superposition of phi eigenstates, where the value of phi is pi times an odd integer. So the bit flip operation that changes a 0 to a 1 and a 1 to a 0 is a translation in phi space by pi. That's the logical x acting on the code. And then I can also Fourier transform these code words and ask what they look like in Q space. And I can choose as a basis the eigenstates of x with eigenvalue plus or minus, where the plus eigenstate is a superposition of Q uh, eigenstates, where the value of Q is an even integer. And the minus eigenstate is a superposition of Q eigenstates where the value of Q is an odd integer. And the logical Z operator that flips the plus to the minus is just a translation in Q space by 1. Now, this code is protected against errors which can be described as distributions on small shifts in phi space and Q space. So if there's a shift in phi space which is less than pi over 2, less than half the translation that we would do to perform the logical x that flips the bit, then that's a correctable error. And the distinguishability of 0 and 1 is not lost. And if we have a shift in q, which is less than 1 half, less than half of the shift that flips the plus and minus eigenstates, that's also a correctable error, which in principle can be reversed. Now, these code words that I've described, these ideal code words, are actually non-normalizable and unphysical. But I can consider instead a approximate code word, which is normalizable and physical. We could think of it, for example, as a sequence of uh, equally spaced Gaussian peaks in phi space governed by a broad Gaussian envelope where the width of the individual peaks, delta, is uh, small compared to 2 pi, and the width of the envelope, kappa inverse, is broad compared to And then if I Fourier transform this approximate code word to see what it looks like in Q space, it has a similar Gaussian grid appearance. That is, now there will be a broad envelope whose width is delta inverse and periodically spaced uh, narrow functions in Q space whose width is given by kappa. So there's some intrinsic error in the approximate code words because there's a, there can be a little bit of leakage of the individual peaks outside the size of a correctable error. But if, for example, each one of the peaks has a width which is less by a factor of 5 than the size of a shift which gives an uncorrectable error, then we can make the intrinsic error of the code words less than one part in a million. It's not really necessary for the peak functions or the envelope function to be Gaussian. I can consider any narrow function periodically repeated governed by some slowly varying broad envelope function, and that too would approximate code word. OK, so now let's come back to how the protected gate is done. I didn't say so before, but when I close the switch and couple the qubit to the LC circuit, that will be done by a tunable Josephson coupling. So I'll turn on J of t, introducing into the Hamiltonian of the oscillator a cosine potential, where the cosine depends on the difference between the phase drop across the inductor in the LC circuit and the phase drop theta across the qubit, which is either 0 or pi, depending on the state of the uh, 0 pi qubit. So if the 0 pi qubit is in the state 0, that means uh, theta is 0, and this is just a cosine potential. And if j is large enough, the potential, which was a harmonic well, now becomes modulated by the cosine and has many local minima, which are located at values of phi, which are uh, 2 pi times an integer. But if theta were equal to pi, then the cosine would be shifted by pi, and the minima would occur at values of phi, which are pi times um, an odd integer. 
And now if we turn on J of t obeying suitable adiabaticity conditions, not too slowly and not too quickly, the, if we started out in the ground state of the harmonic oscillator, the broad Gaussian uh, with large phi fluctuations because the inductance of the LC circuit is large, it would evolve to one of these uh, Gaussian grid states, an approximate code word of the uh, continuous variable code, and it, we would have either the encoded zero or the encoded one according to whether the minima of the cosine occurred at even or odd values of pi. So the zero or one of the zero pi qubit would become imprinted on the code words for this oscillator code. We'll want to turn on J of t on a time scale which is short compared to the period of the circuit itself, but which is long compared to the period of the oscillations in the local cosine wells, um, which is determined, that means we have to have J large enough. Okay, so now once we've prepared these code words, uh, we keep J fixed for a while, and while we do so, the uh, quadratic term in the potential induces a Gaussian operation on our code words. An operation which if we choose the elapsed time that the switch is closed, that the oscillator and qubit are coupled appropriately, can be expressed as e to the minus i phi squared over 2 pi. So that means that if we're in the code state 0 for which phi is an even multiple of pi, this is a trivial phase acting on the state. But if we're in the code state 1 in which phi is an odd multiple of pi, there's a non-trivial phase, which is e to the minus i pi over 2, performing a rotation by pi over 2 about the z-axis in the code space. So what happens once we've prepared the code word and we keep the switch closed for a while is that the state of the oscillator makes a big excursion in a phase space. It leaves the code space, but it eventually comes back to the code space, but it comes back with a twist, with a non-trivial holonomy or Berry phase, which is just this encoded gate. So this is a type of geometric phase gate. The oscillator goes on a trip and comes back with some state-dependent phase, but it's an especially robust type of geometric phase gate. And if we have two qubits connected in parallel, then whether we get the non-trivial phase or not depends on whether the, on the value of the total phase drop across a pair of zero pi qubits, and that means we've done this entangling phase gate. Now, of course, the pulse might not be perfect. We might keep the switch closed a little bit too long or open it too soon, for example. And that means, apart from this ideal Gaussian operation that we would like to do to perform the encoded gate, there will be some additional Gaussian error, error um, with a rotation by an amount epsilon, which is the fractional error in the timing of the pulse. But if epsilon is small, that additional Gaussian operation just causes some modest spreading in Q space. It's a correctable error for the continuous variable code. So we do the ideal uh, Clifford group single qubit rotation uh, together with some correctable error. And because since everything is Gaussian in this case, where we started out in the oscillator, oscillator ground state, we can calculate everything explicitly. If the timing of the pulse is chosen optimally, then there's some intrinsic error in the gate which comes from the non-zero width of the individual peaks in Qs, but that gets exponentially small when the inductance of the circuit is very large. And then we can compute how the error is enhanced when there's a non-zero epsilon due to an imperfect rotation of the code word, but that just induces some multiplicative factor in the error which is close to one if epsilon is small on a scale which is set by the width of the peaks in Q space. But we have to understand, finally, what happens to this correctable error when we open the switch again, when we decouple the oscillator from the qubit. Well, the execution of the gate is really a, a, a three-step process. In the first step, we close the switch. We turn on the coupling between the oscillator and the qubit. Then we keep it closed for a while, and the state goes on this excursion, eventually coming back to the code space. So I'll say that the state is uh, psi begin at the begin excursion and psi end at the end. And then finally, we open the switch, decoupling the oscillator and the qubit, and we get some final state of the oscillator. So let's look at these steps one by one. 
So first of all, while the switch is closing, we're turning on the coupling. And because um, the, we're considering the turning on to be fast compared to the period of the oscillator, the quadratic term in the potential, the phi squared term in the potential, has relatively small effects while the switch is closing. So in a first approximation, let's ignore that. And then the Hamiltonian just has the cosine potential and the kinetic energy term. But the Hamiltonian has a cosine potential whose coefficient has a sign that depends on whether the qubit is 0 or 1. If the qubit is 1, that means the argument of the cosine gets shifted by pi, and that changes the sign of the cosine. Cosine phi term acting in Q space is a translation by either plus 1 or minus 1. And what that means is that the cosine anti-commutes with the logical X error acting on the code space. The operator which has the value plus 1 when Q is close to an even integer and the value minus 1 when Q is close to an odd integer. And so that means that the Hamiltonian in the two cases, depending on the state of the qubit, are related by conjugation by X. And the same is true for the evolution operators that we obtain by integrating the um, Schrodinger equation using that Hamiltonian. And so that allows us to see that when the switch is closed and the rotation of the state begins, that psi begin, in the case where the qubit is in the state 1, is related to psi begin when uh, the qubit is um, in the state 0 by the, uh, well, in this way, that uh, psi 1 begin is x u 0 x acting on psi initial but uh, psi initial, the initial state of the qubit. But now, remember, we started out with very large fl phase fluctuations in phi space, or a very narrow state in Q space for the harmonic oscillator. And that means it's very nearly an eigenstate of x um, if the state has, if it has its support in the interval between minus 1 half and 1 half in Q space. It's an x equals 1 state. So it's a very good approximation to say that x acting on the initial state is 1. And that means that the beginning state, if the qubit is 1, and the beginning state, if the qubit is 0, are just uh, related by the action of the logical operator x. And now we let the state rotate, goes on an excursion, eventually it comes back to the code space. And this relationship between the state when the qubit is 1 and when it's 0 will actually be protected if we don't have a logical phase error. In other words, I can take the linear combination of psi 1 begin and psi 0 begin with a plus sign, and that's an x equals 1 eigenstate. And the linear combination with a minus sign is an x equals minus 1 eigenstate. And because a small error will still be a correctable phase error, that relationship will still be satisfied when we come back to the code space, even if we do a little over-rotation or a little under-rotation. And then, finally, we have to decouple the oscillator and the qubit by opening the switch. And we can argue, as before, that the operator that acts during the opening of the switch in the case where the qubit is 0 and the case where the qubit is 1, they're related by conjugation by x. And that allows us to say that the final state of the operator when it's finally decoupled from the qubit is just given by the logical x acting on the final state of the oscillator when the qubit is 0. x acting on the state when the qubit is 0 is the state of the oscillator when the qubit is 1. So finally, one more step. If we've done everything nicely adiabatically, the oscillator won't get highly excited. It started out very narrow in Q space, and it'll wind up being nar very narrow in Q space at the end. And that means x acting on the final state of the oscillator will uh, be essentially 1. And so that allows us to conclude that the final state of the oscillator is, to a very good approximation, the same, irrespective of whether the state of the qubit was 0 or 1. So there's no entanglement between the oscillator and the qubit. And furthermore, the phase that's acquired is extremely insensitive to the way we implement the gate. And these conclusions still hold if we include the phi squared over 2L term in the potential during the closing and opening of the switch since that just produces some modest additional spreading in Q space, and because the uh, errors, wait, 10 minutes left? And because the states are well protected against uh, 
translations in QSpace, the conclusion doesn't change very much. So sorry, that was a lot of steps, so let me summarize them on one slide. These are the ingredients that make the protected gate work. First of all, there's some symmetry principle which uh, relates the Hamiltonian while the switch is opening or closing in the case where the zero pi qubit is in the state zero to the state of the Hamiltonian when the zero pi qubit is in the state one. Uh, that's because the difference is just a shift in phi space by pi. The state initially has large phase fluctuations, that is, because of the large inductance, phi is very broad and correspondingly Q is very narrow. Then it's important that we prepare good code for this continuous variable code, and that's what protects the symmetry that relates the state when the qubit is zero and the state when the qubit is one. Uh, when we perform the gate, even if we don't perform it perfectly, there's an adiabaticity principle that we wind up with a final state of the oscillator, which is not very excited, so it's still narrow in Q space. And we need some separation of time scales for things to work. In other words, the opening and closing of the gate has to be fast on the scale of the period of the oscillator so that the effect of the harmonic term and the potential is not very big while the switch is opening and closing. So the conclusion is that the oscillator really acts like the ancilla on which the syndrome information gets imprinted. Any noise that's introduced by the imperfect implementation of the gate winds up mussing up the oscillator a little bit, but the final state of the oscillator doesn't know anything about the state of the qubit and the phase is very stable with respect to imperfect implementation of the gate. So uh, trying to estimate the non-adiabatic effects which contribute to the error probability is um, hard to do analytically. We can predict how they scale using Landau-Zener theory, but we can't do very precise calculations. We can simulate the process in which we close the switch, leave it closed for a while, and then open it. So here I've plotted the diamond norm deviation from the ideal phase gate um, as a function of this angle epsilon, which tells me the fractional error in the timing of the pulse. And if we didn't have any non-adiabatic uh, effects, the uh, gate would get down to a error below 10 to the minus 9. Uh, when the error is very small, the static transitions are, are non-negligible, so it becomes something a little bit above 10 to the minus 8. But it stays pretty stable so that uh, the error is about the same if we introduce errors of the order of 1% in the implementation of the pulse. Actually, that was for the case where we start out in the ground state of the harmonic oscillator. Um, but a similar conclusion will hold if the initial state of the oscillator is not too highly excited, if it's a low-lying uh, excitation of the oscillator, because that will still be narrow in Q space, which is the key thing that we need initially. And so if the temperature is low compared to the frequency of the oscillator so that we have a thermal state to begin with, the air in the gate won't be much affected by the temperature. And we can also check that the implementation of the gate is robust with respect to fluctuations in the Hamiltonian, which introduce some anharmonicity in the oscillatonian or some higher harmonics in the Josephson energy. Now, the remarkable accuracy of the gate really hinged on this assumption that we have a very large inductance. And one could ask whether that's reasonable. I guess I forgot to say, I should have when I showed you the plot, this was for particular values of the parameters. The square root of L over C, this dimensionless inductance parameter, was chosen to be 80. And the square root of JC being 8 means uh, it's the reciprocal of this number, which determines the width of the uh, individual peaks in phi space. And we chose the optimal time scale for the switch to open and close in order to get uh, this performance. So we need that large inductance for the thing to work well. And you can ask whether it's reasonable for this number to be this big. And it may, in fact, be a big practical problem to get such a large inductance in a superconducting circuit. Um, the kind of wants on geometrical grounds to be of order one, and we want it to be quite large. One way in which you can get a large inductance in principle, as I mentioned earlier, is to chain together many Josephson junctions. And actually, that was done with a different motivation by the Yale group, and they observed 
a value of this parameter, which was about six for a chain of 43 jo Josephson junctions. And in principle, you could scale that up to a much longer chain to get a, a much larger value of this uh, impedance, but there may be reasons why that's not so practical. Maybe a more promising approach is to uh, use materials which have a large intrinsic kinetic inductance to um, build the superconducting circuits. Of course, what I've described is just some Clifford uh, phase gates, single qubit and two qubit gates, which are not enough for universality by themselves. But we can boost to a universal set of gates by using state distillation ideas, a la Bravi and Kata, so that if we, in addition, can perform measurements of our qubit in the x basis that are accurate, and uh, pi over 4 rotation about the z-axis, which is not protected and has only a so-so fidelity, then we can use state distillation to get accurate universal gates. Um, it may be that uh, the measurements are noisy in this type of scheme. Uh, I'll come to that in a second. Um, if we can do something about controlling the noise in the measurements, then a two-qubit phase gate uh, really is a useful tool for fault tolerance if we can do it with extremely high fidelity, even though it's a non-universal Clifford group gate. Well, as far as the noise in the measurements is concerned, if we can do the measurements non-destructively, that is, with the small probability of flipping the value of the measured observable when we do the measurement, then we can imagine repeating the measurements many times to make them more reliable. Alternatively, we can use repetition coding to make the measurements more reliable. I won't go into the details, but what uh, is shown here is a way of teleporting a CNOT gate um, encoded using a repetition code where the two qubit gates shown are two qubit phase gates of the type that we know how to do reliably. And the arrows pointing to the right are X eigenstate preparations. And the arrows pointing to the left are X basis measurements. And in this case, we don't have to repeat the measurements. We can uh, decode the results in the repetition code by doing majority voting every time we make a measurement. And if, for example, we can do a C phase gate, which has uh, accuracy or a uh, error rate per gate of 10 to the minus 5, then even if the measurements have a 1% error rate, we could do this teleported C naught gate to 10 to the minus 6 accuracy. OK, so to summarize, um, of course, we expect to be, have to use fault tolerance ideas to operate large scale quantum computers. And if we can manage to do a protected two qubit, two qubit Clifford phase gate with very high fidelity, that could be a powerful tool for fault tolerance, even if measurements and other gates are noisy. In the case of these zero pi protected qubit superconducting circuits, if we can turn on and off a tunable coupling to an oscillator, a tunable Josephson junction, then we can do single qubit and two qubit Clifford gates with very high fidelity, fidelity which gets exponentially close to one if we can choose the system parameters appropriately. What makes the gate work is an underlying continuous variable quantum code, which protects against phase errors. But the zero pi qubit itself and the protected gate requires building circuits which have a very large inductance in natural units, and that might not be easy to achieve. The gate itself is robust against non-zero temperature and fluctuations in the Hamiltonian of the system. So I don't know if this particular approach to doing protected gates will turn out to be practical, but I do think it's important to continue to seek ways of doing reliable gates that rely on the nature of the physical encoding of the quantum information. And here I've suggested one possible step in that direction. Thanks for listening. Uh, questions? Mike in the back. Thanks. That was a really nice talk, and Thanks. it's extremely interesting, uh, in particular to me, because there's some similarity, at least in feel, to the idea of dynamical modulation, which I know a little better than this, I guess. But what I was wondering about at the end of your talk, where you showed some of the downsides of trying to achieve this high L on C ratio, is uh, the fact that in 
trapped ions, as you know, we do these uh, geometric phase gates by exciting and de-exciting a harmonic oscillator. And initially, there's no intrinsic protection against uh, timing errors. You really have to make a closed loop in phase space, otherwise there's a very significant gate infidelity, the first order. But if you modulate the coupling to that, uh, to that motional mode in a way that's reminiscent of dynamical decoupling, you can actually build in intrinsic, uh, build in robustness against these timing errors. So I was curious if you think there's any possibility that you can reduce the requirement for L on C being 80 to something closer, because you're only off by a factor of 10 or so from what uh, you said Devere had achieved, if you can add in some other concepts of dynamic modulation. Okay, so the question was, uh, is it possible that we could combine together having the very large square root of L over C, but not quite as large as I seem to require, with some uh, modulation in time of the coupling uh, of the oscillator to the qubit, uh, since it's uh, known in other contexts that geometric phase gates can be made more robust by such modulation? Uh, I'm repeating the question because I'm stalling. I don't really have an answer. <laughs> And also, um, it's, sound, it's a good question, but I haven't really thought about that. Other question? Oh, hold on. Oh. Oh. oh, the state preparation for the um, oscillator? Yeah. Right. Well, I just assumed it was a thermal state at some temperature, which all compared to the oscillator frequency. So the explicit calculation that I described, in particular the plot, was for the case where the initial state of the oscillator is the ground state of the LC circuit. And uh, if the, so that's strictly zero temperature. If the temperature is non-zero, but small compared to the frequency, so it might be in an excited state, but with some suppressed probability, uh, then, it, then it still works. After we do the gate, the oscillator doesn't return to the initial thermal state or ground state. In fact, it uh, becomes the repository for the entropy that's introduced by the noise. And if I tried to use it again, the gate wouldn't be quite as accurate. So at some point, I'm going to want to cool the oscillator back down in order to reuse it in a high fidelity gate. There's a question way in the back. Yeah, time for a minute. One oh, more sorry. question. Where is it? Uh, over there. Okay. When you described uh, achieving uh, better protection with increasing the number, uh, with increasing the chain of the Josephson junction, uh, possible variations in the, between the individual junctions in the chain, would they affect anything? I, I, so I'm sorry, you're, I didn't hear the last part of the question. The question is about getting a high inductance yes, from a long yes, chain yes, of yes. Josephson junctions and yes, the rest of it? Yes. So small variations, they wouldn't affect anything in this scheme? Oh, a small variation along the chain in yes, the device yes, parameters? Yes, yes. Oh, would, so in, in other words, if I added some disorder to the chain, yes. uh, how would it oh. affect oh. the performance? Uh -huh. uh, well, I think it would probably be fairly tolerant of disorder because the, the key thing is just to have the inductance of the whole composite device large compared to the capacity. I think one of the practical problems is if you really try to build a long thing, um, because it's getting geometrically large, it's hard to keep the capacitance from, you know, scaling up with the size of the device as well as the inductance. But I don't think disorder is a fundamental problem. Okay, uh, let's thank John again. Uh okay, our next speaker is Lorenzo